Are you ready for a story? This is a story from so long ago. It was when men still had a hand on the tail of the Wolverine. And the women. If I was to tell you about the women, I would have to say, a great firebird lived in their chest. And wherever these women's hips sashayed through life, red feathers fell. And it was a time like that that the Seneca people walked this earth and the great forests of this very land. Once upon a time there was a young boy and as he grew he seemed to make trouble wherever he went. He played with the other boys and girls, wrists got snapped, bruises came easily, he had too much trouble in him. So at a certain point, his family put him into the care of his uncle. Now his uncle was not just any uncle. His uncle was a shaman, his uncle was a medicine man, his uncle was one who inspects the underside of the universe. And he lived in a hut on the edge of a great forest. And so the young boy came to live with his uncle. And it was as if his uncle turned his head away from the herds of cattle and the marketplace and the ambitions of the family, he said, that is not the way your life is going to go. And he said, well, uncle, I'm in your hands. What do you want me to do? And he said, I want you to go out into the forest first thing tomorrow morning. And he said, fantastic. I think I could be a great hunter. He didn't sound like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I could be a great hunter. I think I could bring you back lion or elk or cougar or the great moving snakes that go through the ground fantastic this is a job for me and his uncle said i don't want you to do any of those things he said well what do you want me to do and he said i want you to go as far as you can into the forest sit under a great tree and listen and he said well, well for how long and he said oh nine hours will do i want you to go out and listen and so the young boy with, you know, barely a packed lunch, made his way into the great forest, found a great tree, sat underneath and listened. That night he went back to his uncle, told him everything he'd seen. And his uncle said, fantastic, get used to it. You're going to be doing it now for at least five years. And his uncle was correct because every single day, seven days a week, this young boy took himself out into the forest, not to hunt, and not even to track or to trail, but simply to listen. Can you imagine what that must be like? Can you imagine what you would see over those years in the forest? He saw many strange things. In such a wild place, he saw the discipline and the repetition that animals actually truly hold. He saw that wildness is the dance partner of discipline. He saw all of these things. He saw all of the seasons. They weathered his body. Until finally he came to that stormy river that separates adolescence from young manhood. And it was at the end of yet another of these days and years of listening that just before he left, he heard... He could hear a song coming from far in the west. There were great mountains in the west and he could hear the song coming from them. And it went like this. I am coming to be your wife. 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 
It was the most beautiful sound he had ever heard. And he ran like the young deer back to his uncle and he said, I have heard a sound. I have heard a sound coming from the mountains far in the west as the sky was growing dark. Can you tell me anything about this song that I've heard? Because someone says they're coming to be my wife. And the uncle sort of smiled wryly to himself and said, well, this is good news. The voice you heard comes from a woman. And women's voices are very interesting. And truly enough, she is coming to be your wife. But I have news. She's bringing her mother. <laughs> That's the bad news. <laughs> and her mother is a very different type of animal to the young woman singing you that tune. But anyway, enough of this darkness. You'll find her soon enough. Let's get some gear on your back. You've got to look good when you meet your bride. And so they changed into various, you know, buckskin costumes, and there was all this paraphernalia hanging off him. And it was very, very exciting. But he said, look, I, I must tell you about this mother. The mother's sole purpose is to fuck you up. <laughs> and I'm not talking about, you know, a couple of hard lessons. She wants to annihilate you. She doesn't like young men. Especially not ones like you. Ones that maybe think they're a bit special. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> go with God, but go. <laughs> so the young boy, who we will call the listener, for obvious reasons, made his way back to the great tree, sat underneath it, and waited. Sure enough, as it got dark, as the sky turned those great purples and pinks, from the mountains far in the west, he heard the song. I am coming to be your wife. 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 And in the dusk he saw her coming indeed. She was floating in the belly of a great canoe. This canoe was not in a river. This canoe was held in the air itself and came gliding slowly from those mountains in the west. And behind her in the canoe were nine sisters, almost as beautiful as she was. But the uncle had not lied. In the back of the canoe, a blur of shadows, fox skulls, and the screech owl herself was the great, dark, many-fanged mother. If you tried to look at her straight on, surely enough, you would turn to stone. So the young man is standing by the tree in his wedding regalia. Who was in the back of your canoe when you went to get married? Think on. <laughs> Think on. So the canoe, the beautiful woman at the front, the nine sisters behind, the terrible dark mother at the back of the canoe floated up to the young man looked down on him and then floated away because surely all witches live in the east and they were heading home. They were heading to their longhouses in the mountains of the east. So there he was, taking in the whole scene and they'd gone. You know what it's like with women. A lot of the business is them making sure you see them and they see you and then leaving without much explanation. It was that story again. But was this young man a defenseless boy? Was he a defenseless boy? No. He was not a defenseless boy. And the reason why we know he wasn't a defenseless boy was because he had a horn. The kind of horn you would blow. If you had a horn that you could blow, what would it sound like?
But this young man did not aim that horn up into the sky where the birds live, but down onto the ground. He would blow into the earth itself, and rather like seven league boots, this horn could gather up soil and time, and you could traverse great distances in seconds if you had a horn like this, a horn of earth. So to the astonishment of the mother witch, to the astonishment of the ten sisters, within seconds, the listener, with his horn, had arrived at the camp in the forest. Nine sisters, nine other suitors, nine other young men. And they were there, and it was a time of year rather like this. The leaves were starting to fall off the trees. The first snows were in the air. And the witch looked on. There was a fire for the men to sleep by. There was a fire for the women to sleep by. But the old woman said, I'm very hungry. <laughs> You're interested in one of my daughters. Again, didn't speak like this. You're interested in one of my daughters. Go out and find me something to eat. No! <laughs> You've all got one of these living in you. You know exactly what she sounds like. So the men went out en masse and they found a hollow tree and in that hollow tree was a great bear. And these were in the times when men and bears had a sympathetic relationship. When deep magics moved from your belly to their belly and that bear laid down its life willingly for those young men. A bear in a hollow tree. And they brought the great bear back to the witch and they skinned it for her and they took the fur away and she said, I want to be alone with the flesh now. <laughs> Maybe at the end, the, another, the nine sisters or the ten sisters picked away, but by now night was falling and it was cold. And so the men with their fire and the women with theirs went to sleep. But when you fall asleep... In the presence of a great dark witch, keep your wits about you, because the many-fanged one wandered the camp in the still of the night, and she called up to one of the trees and said, Turn down, tree! The tree bent, and using whatever magic she had on her tongue at that moment, the clothes lifted from the men landed on the top of the bent tree. The bent tree then made itself stiff and the men lay there growing blue and cold. And she said, let's see what happens now. Giggling to herself, she waddled back to her sleeping place and went to sleep. Had the listener not been there, those men would have died where they slept. But he woke and he looked around and he saw the situation and he had some relationship with those trees that you and I can only guess at. And he called the tree down. The clothes came back on the bodies. The men warmed themselves up as best they could. They did the old dances. They sang the old songs to sing themselves back to life. And they survived the night. Well, first thing in the morning, same situation. The canoe leaves. And the men were desperate to catch up with the women. You know that feeling. How do we catch up with the women? They seem to be gliding on air in a way I can't understand. And the listener said something very wise. He said, be cool. It's very important that you be cool. And you do not race after women like that. Because I have a horn of the earth. I think Lorca had a horn like this, and Rilke, and Bark. You have something made of the discipline of listening that means you can travel at extraordinary leaps and speeds. Travel with me, with my horn of earth. And again, in seconds, they had caught up with the canoe and with the new camp. And the witch was astonished. She said, I feel discombobulated. I feel absolutely discombobulated. How did they catch up? What has he got? What has he got? 
Well, sure enough, she was hungry again. Sure enough, she wanted food. Sure enough, the men went out. Sure enough, they found another animal that lay down its life for them. And they brought it back. She took it away. She gobbled it up. And then again, they all went to sleep. But this time, it was not the witch that walked the camp in the middle of the night. The listener rose quietly and walked to where the women slept. The listener looked at the tallest pine tree and said, please bend over for me. And it was the listener that sang some deep, strange, ancestral message of the forest that made the clothes of the women rise from their bodies and land on the top of the highest tree. And then the coup de grace, my friends, he said to that tree, nobody and nothing will bring those clothes down apart from me. And then he did something else, some final piece. He put his hand in the cold ashes of the fire and then he threw them up in the air and as those ashes went up into the air it started to snow. If you put your hand in the ashes you can change the temperature of a room or a situation and he carried that knowledge and it began to snow on the naked bodies of the women around the small fire and the witch slept on and that is where we shall leave them for now so we're going to do what we always do is just close your eyes and let's feed the story a little bit it's very rich where do you find yourself where are you in the story and please speak it out where do you find yourself Try to go back through from the beginning, walking through the story, and see if there's some place where you stop. Chasing the women. <laughs> the hollow tree. First thing, the canoe. Still sitting under the tree. Trying to be cool. <laughs> <laughs> Dressing up for the girls and having them walk right by. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Singing, I'm coming to you. <laughs> I think I can be a good hunter. Yeah. <clears throat> I have the horn, but I'm afraid to blow it. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Undoing the tricks of the mother. Yeah. The snow falling down. Mm. <clears throat> Changing the ashes. Mm. Being handed off to the uncle. Mm. The great bear. Mm. Talking to the tree. Mm. Viewing these naked women. <laughs> 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 Being the crazy uncle. So when you heard the song, when you were there under that tree in your life, did you see who was at the back of the canoe? Well, what, you know, one of the clues in any story, whether it's a European fairy tale or, an, or a native story, is when you get a succession of brothers or a succession of sisters, you are having a clue that within our lives we will probably meet this scene many times. And there could be many times where we are going to be devoured by that witch. And he happens to be, this is his tenth shot really. It's our tenth shot at relationship. And this time, maybe we have attuned our ears well enough to see what is coming towards us. But when I was 21, I had no idea of what was at the back of the boat. And I had no idea what was at the back of my fucking boat. You know, what was at the back of your boat? One of the things I think Danny's probably already mentioned, but is the plurality that lives within myth. 
And the genius of myth is that you see situations from many different perspectives. Before the break, we were talking about truth. And I would say, and Danny would agree completely, is truths, truths with an S. And occasionally it may seem there's a truth in our life, but the genius of these stories is when it feels that the story is being told by many different energy systems. You can tell when you read maybe Hans Christian Andersen, there's a human at the center of that, you know? But these stories carry, the images are so wild, I sometimes wonder if it truly was a raven that is telling this story, or a mad badger. Any other thoughts about it? I really hung up by the, um, the listening because for me, we, in our culture, we so much are afraid of silence mm -hmm. and how terrifying that is. And as a culture, nobody wants silence. No. You get in your car and it's always music, it's always a goddamn radio or whatever, it's a TV set at home. And in that's <coughs> where we're getting a lot of our lives. <coughs> so it, it really moves me on the silence. And he has the impulse of a warrior, doesn't he, at the beginning? And the, the uncle will not indulge it. He won't indulge it. He won't give him that way into, he says, no, you're going some other way. It's as if he's taken his head and just turned it. Do you remember? He's turned it away from the, the cattle and the fields and the young lovers and aimed it directly at the forest. Away from the domestic life. Yeah. I noticed uh, something really interesting in the language of the story is that it's through listening that he sees. Mm. And, uh, and I think that that's, that's a, something really important. That's a, that's a crucial medicine to, because we see mostly without listening. Mm. No. But this young man, uh, he learns to listen, and through his listening, he sees what's really happening. So, both seeing and listening are active, they're not looking, and the hearing are passive. So, he's there, he's in it, he's working <laughs> to hear, and listen, and to see. <coughs> And uh, have you noticed how successful he is so far? Yeah. Think that's going to last? <laughs> no. But he's off to a very good start. Mm. A deceptively good start, some would say. Mm. Mm. There's something about the listening. When you listen, you listen in 360 degrees. <coughs> You know, but when you see, you know, because we're predators, you only see in, you know, 180 degrees. Mm. Uh, and so by listening, you know, he's actually seeing in 360 degrees oh. all around. Uh, but the hunter, uh, he learns to focus mm. in only a, a, in a penetrating way and doesn't see what's going on. So that's what kind of that's thing. good too. Yeah. yeah. So he's in he's active, but he's in a in a an active receptive mm. Mm. mode. Who do you think is doing that kind of work? Who's listening in our society? Who are we around that's doing that? Poets. Poets someone say. That's good. Children. Children. <laughs> <laughs> Some. <laughs> yeah. Some journalists, they purposely be quiet because it makes them a bit uncomfortable with silence. They'll speak their mind and they'll quote. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Another way of thinking about the listener is he's probably spent six years attending to his own inner nature. So although we see this as a forest, and we see this as a lightning storm, and we see this as the movement of a badger. This is going on inside him. And in a way, he's been given this almost like a cinderbiter. You know the cinderbiter stories where you lie by the ashes for a long period. This tremendous time of incubation. He has not got to bring meat into the house. That's not his role yet. This other world, you know, um, 
I work a lot with young men, uh, especially with attention deficit disorder. Uh, and we work specifically the, the most chronic cases of uh, attention deficit disorder. We go through a process very similar to what this, this young guy goes through. Uh, and we talk a lot about the idea of uh, authenticity before authority. Authenticity before authority. That you are awake in some way to your inner world and how your inner world and the wildness of that relates very, very clearly to the landscape that you're living in. But it has to be a break from the domestic, as Danny was saying. Uh -huh. Part of the business of initiation and rites of passage is how do we at the same time praise what comes from the village? You know, praise what is it inherited from your father. You know, Robert talks about there was a time before the Industrial Revolution when, and he, I love this phrase, we lived in murderous proximity. <laughs> murderous proximity to our fathers and our uncles and the rest of it. But there is a time where what you could call explicit information, which is what a family can teach you, which is what your society can teach you or your community, needs to be replaced by what you could call tacit information. The wild ecstatic epiphanies of the forest and all the struggles and the business that entails. And the complexity of a culture that has initiation at its center is forming some weird fucking paradoxical crossroads relationship between what these two impulse systems want. And the mistake is to think that they want the same thing. They don't want the same thing. But what the soul seems to want is for you to live in the trouble of both. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Should we find our way back in? We remember the young man. We remember the many years he looked in just one direction. To look deeply into the heart of the wild, as we have said, is to see discipline and repetition and animals following the same tracks over and over again. And the old storytellers tell us, if we stay true to that, then one day we are going to hear a song. And you remember, the Celts always say, that the soul of a man is female. And the soul of a woman is male. Could this song be something to do with an opening of his own soul? And does it take us that many years to hear what the soul may be trying to sing to us? I'm coming to be your wife, I'm coming to be your wife, I'm coming to be your wife, I'm coming to be your wife. But I'm bringing my fucking mother. Did you come of your own accord? Or did someone send you? So there were the women freezing around the fire. And of course the great witch woke immediately. And she turned herself into a bat. And she flew to the top of the tree. But we remember what the young man said. Nobody and nothing can get these clothes down. And that was the case. She could do nothing. She landed back on earth. She reconfigured herself into a bouncing squirrel. Clambered up the tree again and could do nothing. Oh, listener! Oh, listener! What is it? Would you possibly consider bringing our clothes back down from the tree, please? And he said, well, I will. But if you keep fucking with me, you will get more of the same. Capiche? <laughs> That's ancient Iroquois, my friends. <laughs> You heard it here first. <laughs> Capiche? And she said, Capiche? <laughs> Tree immediately bends, clothes are given back, and they reconfigure themselves, and they move on. Now, yet again, by now, the other men are utterly dependent on the listener and this horn that he has. You know what it's like when there's just one of you in the gang. 
that you know pulls on this one, and you can all hold on to his wings and cover great distances. I think some of us have been holding on to the wings of someone <coughs> over here over the years that's had one of these horns. Get my feeling? So, witches are always travelling east, and their camp was to the east. And that canoe floated on, that canoe floated on just like it has in our own lives so many times. But the men followed as best they could, still enamoured with the women's beauty. Until up ahead was a huge, great ice mountain. A mountain so wide you could not go round it. A mountain so deep you could not dig underneath it. A mountain you could only climb. But how do you climb a mountain made entirely of ice? Well, that canoe immediately floated on the breeze up, 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 and over the top and down the other side where the woman's longhouse was where the great witch lived. But the men... Fuck. <laughs> what now, illustrious leader? How are we going to get over that? You know, your horn is amazing, but I, I don't think there's anything we can do about this, this enormous mountain made entirely of ice. And he said, ah, my friends... A horn of earth was not the only thing I gained in my years in the forest. And he pulled out his small medicine bundle. And a bird came out of it. A bird you would know as a red robin. Your kind of robin, not an English robin. Your robin. And this robin was making interesting noises. And without delay, he placed the robin on the top of his head. And it started to sing. And the sound it made was very, very old. And very, very beautiful. And if you had heard it, you would have thought of God. And many of the men wept when they heard the sound of that red robin. And with each trill and sound of joy that came from it, a little footfall melted in the ice. Now one after the other, the men started to climb the small footfalls that were made by the sound of the robin singing. And as they went higher and higher and higher into the sky, the listener turned and he said, I have something to warn you about. This is a deeply enchanted mountain and when you get to the top of it, a voice will try and call you to look at them. I have learnt something from listening. And what I have learnt from listening is don't listen to every voice that speaks to you. Because trouble enough will come from that. So when you get to the top of this great mountain and you hear a voice sweetly praising you, raising you in status. Do not fucking listen to it. And they climbed and they climbed and they climbed. And I am happy to say that nine of the men got to the top of the mountain and started to climb down the other side. But of course, in us, there is always that one, isn't there? Who is desperate for praise? And when that, that last one got to the top, Old witchy, and the old storytellers say she had bells. She said, oh, you're a gorgeous boy. You're so handsome, so much better than your brothers. You're such a beautiful young man, my God. Hair like the midnight and eyes like the morning. Turn, let me gaze in the radiance of your beautiful face. He said, must be strong, must climb down other side of mountain. Look at me, my darling. Look at me. I have many breasts. <laughs> and each one of them lactates deadly nightshade. Well, out of pure fucking idle curiosity, he did indeed catch the trance gaze of the witch and immediately fell down, 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 down to the bottom of the mountain. I have to tell you, 
At the bottom of this mountain is a bone pile made entirely of the bones of dead men that chose to catch the gaze of the witch. There's not one or two bodies of men here. There's thousands. If you were to see the bones, you would see they were covered in moss and spiders moved between them. And the men, very slowly, with the robin still singing, got to the bottom of the mountain and gazed at the bone pile soberly. And of course, on the top is their recently deceased member of the clan. The witch had a great long house with three fires in it that never went out and there were ten beds for the ten sisters and then she didn't sleep in a bed, the witch. There was just a sort of pile of entrails and bones and she made herself very comfortable there and occasionally small dogs would try and nip past her and her hand would reach out and she'd eat them. And she said, well, it wouldn't be appropriate at all for the men to be sleeping in with the women in here. Anything could happen. I do have standards. What do you take me for? We have other accommodation for you. Come round the back. <laughs> and there was another long house made entirely of ice. Ice. The witches love the ice. They love the cold. She said, in you go. In you go. Get, get, get settled. There's little seats. There's little seats in there. And I will bring you some soup. Immediately the witch left, the door zoom, sealed in on itself. And the listener, recognizing the situation he was in, turned to his brothers and said this, Do not sit down. If we go easy now, if we sit down now on these ice chairs, we are finished. Stand up, dance, sing, move your body, find the fire within you pulls out his little medicine bag, put the rob in again, and again the sound, and again the men think of God, and again this great ice house starts to melt. Drip, drop, drip, drop, drip, drop, drip, drop, drip, drop, drip. Soon they can see little flecks of blue, and they can see that life-saving heat from the sun starting to come in. As they're looking up, zoom, appears the witch again, and she had a bowl with her, a bowl of soup. What was in the bowl, Danny? Eyeballs. It was. Eyeballs and poison. Eyeballs and poison, our old favourites. And she said, I've got something for you. I've got something for you. I've been preparing it for an awfully long time. You know, have, have a lot. Well, of course, the listener took a little sip, swilled it round, spat it out and said, well, thank you, madam. We'll be on our way soon. She tried several different tricks, but of course none of them could work, and all the time in the background that little bird is chirp, 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 and all the time the great ice house is melting. Until finally there was no ice house left, and the men are standing there with the robin and the listener, and the women are talking to their mother and say, for God's sake, let him in. But in the middle of it, one of the daughters said to the uh, witch, I think we've made a big mistake this time. And I think this man is going to kill you and is then going to kill all of us. But I think we need to let them in. And that is where we shall leave them for now. Take yourself back the trail of the story. Find an image, find a moment. The consequences of listening to the voice <coughs> that praises yeah. you. Yeah. Idle fucking curiosity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Being on the bone pile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The death of praise. Mm -hmm. Singing and dancing in the ice house. Yeah. Bringing the robin out of the medicine pouch before <coughs> the mountain. Mm -hmm. I have many breasts. <laughs> 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 You're so much better looking than your other brothers. <laughs> yeah. The old sound that makes you think of God. Yeah. Mm. Being on the bone pile, waiting to die. 
standing at the foot of the mountain. The danger of praise. Yeah. Watching helplessly as the ice door closes. Mm -hmm. Remember Hansel and Gretel, the story of Hansel and Gretel, mm -hmm. where he keeps, she wants to get him in the oven, and he keeps twisting. He won't go in there. I always think of that with this story when she's trying. What harm, what harm could it be? One glimpse. <laughs> could we, could we, give me, give, give us something around this horn, this horn of dark earth. How do you get one of those? What is it? What do you feel it is? Practice long enough so that then what you know is like a great leap instantly because you can handle a, whole, a lot of it in a flash. Mm -hmm. And then that, the knowledge is, is like a movement. Mm -hmm. The horn is the opposite of listening. Mm -hmm. It beckons and it announces, which is the, you know, the opposite of uh, listening. The result of this. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it feels very clear without his time in the forest, he would not have that horn. I think you get the horn from a place of death. <coughs> ah. <coughs> the horn gets its power from the soil. Yeah. You were saying, weren't you, Danny, that it wasn't a Pu'er image? Right, it's not, it's not a flying boy image where you're... you're moving quickly by ascending. It has a descent energy. It has some duende energy to it. And I really relate it to the power of, of the bison. Um, that when it says uh, that the horn gathers up the distance uh, and, and, the, and he and the other men are able to move very rapidly over great distances because um, just like the buffalo, you know, have that power to, to gather up the distance. Mm. Sound, sound travels distance. And when you listen, you hear sound. Yeah. Soil contains uh, geologic time uh, <coughs> from the uh, eras it took to create and assemble the, the mineral elements into that place. And it also contains the seasons of the organic matter of growth and decay over a vast number of time scales. Mm. So to have something that can access mm. all of that in that kind of range is what it sounds like. Mm. So he can draw on a sort of psychic knowledge of time and cycles of time but it's, and he can move at great speed because of it. I, I think there's a, a correlation there with what Martin was saying about uh, authenticity first and then authority. I think that listening is what gives him authenticity. And then horn is a, you know, is a mark. It's emblematic. Talisman. Yeah. 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 So listening, he has, he has, um, has come to understand his, his connection and his part in mm -hmm. the natural world, the geologic time, mm -hmm. that he, he knows that, he has embodied that. As, as Sage was saying, uh, the soil contains the cycles of, of life, mm -hmm. dec decomposed generations, including humans, mm -hmm. of course, so mm -hmm. he's also um, speaking with his ancestors, his human ancestors, who are the soil, in, in, the, in the Akhenagan language, mm -hmm. I, um, and I think that is true for many Native American languages, many indigenous languages, um, you can't say people without saying the land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
I was just in uh, Andalusia, uh, sort of chasing Lorca's ghost uh, until very recently, and this story was moving round and around in my body. And I always have this image of Lorca with this, this horned, this horn of earth that means he can travel vast distances very, very quickly. And his associative life with his, within his poems, I see him having leapt from one place to another to another. You know, in the, in the Irish stories, in the Welsh, uh, the Taliesin, or the, Irish, the Welsh stories, he can change from a salmon into a, cr into a piece of wheat and into a crested hen in seconds. He's got some of that, and this guy seems to have some of it. Yeah, he's a shape. Uh, the Taliesin, or the, Irish, the Welsh stories, he can change from a salmon into a, cr into a piece of wheat and into a crested hen in seconds. He's got some of that, and this guy seems to have some of it. Yeah, he's a shapeshifter. It sticks with me, the commitment that he had as a young boy, man, um, to go out every day yeah. for five years um, to just listen, whether um, doing it out of honor for his uncle or just himself, but that kind of commitment to stick with that for so long and then gain the knowledge and the tools um, the horn, um, his medicine pouch with the bird, and who knows what else is in it, the ability to talk with the trees. Um, just to, for him to be able to have the commitment to stick with that for so long may, is making the rest of his <coughs> life so far um, able to move through it, to continue on um, finding an obstacle and <coughs> having the ability to overcome that and um, continue. <laughs> I find that none, none of the things that are achieved by the brother or the brothers mm. are done through physical uh, strength or prowess that mm. he works within concert with the horn and with the bird, whatever the bird did. And, uh, and interesting thing that it's, it's not an eagle, as is so often in stories, it's not a huge eagle, but it's a very tiny, tiny bird who does something musical mm. or magical mm -hmm. that allows them to move yeah. through. True. True. <coughs> I think the uh, thing of listening is very important. And that's, that's what I was thinking about when we were reading it. And I've got, uh, I try to teach my boys uh, the importance of listening because they're always talking and making tons of noise. Mm. So I tell them all the time, mm. you need to listen to me because you can't learn if your mouth is open. I try to remind you. <coughs> to, to me, the horn is a physical and a practical manifestation of his faith in what he listens to. Mm. Yeah. He, well, that's interesting. He, that amazing line about don't listen to everything. There are voices that it is not appropriate to take on board, and if you do, you're fucked. You know. In this... This association we have with the witch and intense cold, intense cold, we think about, you know, that's how she operates. Uh, many of you will be familiar, I'm sure, you know, Marie-Louise von Franz and her work around uh, the witch and the giant. Uh, and the witch certainly, I don't know, I, when I'm at conferences like this, I'll always go through a stage where I feel very isolated. I feel that everyone's in on something and I'm not quite getting it. I'm too thick. Uh, and, and my old habit is then to, re to remove myself from what is going on. And as soon as I'm doing that, I'm in the presence of the witch. Because the witch is the one that wants to pull me away from my neighbors and create an ice mountain between me and you. And the clearest way it happens for me when I live at home is I continually do it with my neighbors. Uh, who I don't really know. Uh, you know, Machado, in my solitude I have seen many things that were not true. Story of my fucking life. I sit there and I think, well, you know, he barely glanced at me when, when, when he drove past the other day. He obviously has children in his cellar that he's torturing. <laughs> it, must, it, it can only be. And we obviously are not getting on and this thing needs to be confronted now. And of course, the next time we're, we're putting the bins out, he goes, oh, Martin, how are you doing? And in a second, I realize I've been, in, I have been caught. The witch deals in not a feeling, but a mood. 
not a feeling but a mood and that mood descends and it seems you are in a mild possession state and she's dealing with a lot of cold and in the stories the giants tend to be connected with heat and rage and fury and all that man stuff you know and swinging arms but it's the witch and those icicles that is so strong in this story Mood that can come on, you know, with the with the rapidness of like a white squall or something like yeah. that. It can just like be on you or be before you even know it. Yeah. What if, what do you do when that happens? I try to catch it early if I can, and and change the change the scene. Get up, move around, or get up. And it's good to have a robin in, in your bundle at that point. Is so they have a a robin. Something that sometimes I just start to sing. That's, it. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah. You know, uh, what's interesting is somebody said it wasn't an eagle, and I think if you're a listener and you're listening to all the birds, uh, boy, there's not one I would pick more for its song than the robin. Yeah. You know, that beautiful song. Uh, so it's good to have a song um, so that you can sing to the witch. Quickly. And go back to the tree quickly. Yeah. I want to come back to this idea of authenticity and authority mm. for a moment and uh, notice that, um, that the first thing I think that this young man listens to is his uncle. And it's the, you know, when the uncle says, no, you're not going to do that, you're not going to be a great hunter. You're going to go out and sit in one place and listen. Mm. And uh, there's a kind of granting of authority that the young man gives to his uncle in that moment. Mm. Right? And, uh, yeah. and trust. Yeah. And, then, and there, it, trust risks betrayal. This is something very important. If there's no risk of betrayal, there is no trust. Okay, but the point I wanted to get at is is something that Robert wrote about extensively in a book called The Sibling Society, which is the society that we live in, and uh, and and we don't have adults and and we don't trust authority. We don't defer to authority very well, and one of the reasons for that is because. There's such a lack of authenticity. Mm. There's such yeah. a tremendous lack of authenticity mm. that what we have is authority that's like a tree with no roots. Yeah, it's just an empty shell, hollow yeah. shell. Right, yeah. and so, and you notice when yeah. you give someone a flashlight and say you're in charge of the parking lot they go crazy. for the wedding, yeah. and they say, you can't park there! I want you to move that car three feet this way. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah. They become yeah, the yeah, tyrant yeah. Yeah. of the parking lot. Yeah, uh, because we're all starving yeah. for authority. Yeah, and and but we don't have a relationship to uh, our own authenticity. Yeah, and so we have this strange relationship mm. with resisting authority mm. because we can't get our own. Mm. So I, that's the path. Yeah. I, I have a friend, and you must have witnessed this or done this yourself, where you say, what are you going to do with your life, at least for the next six months? And he says, oh, I have, I have absolutely no idea. I, I really don't know. To choose would be a, you know, oh, I, I can't do it. But, you know, he'll be part of some local committee where they're making puerile decisions about, you know, a little track just outside his house. And he's like fucking Hitler. <laughs> I don't want to make any really big thoughts about the, my life. You, you cannot get rid of these impulses. You know, you can say I, I'm, I am absolutely cynical about the hero and the trickster and my own beauty and the rest of it, but it's going to go somewhere. Miguel earlier on saying, you know, if you ignore mythic impulses that move through cultures and societies and countries, they're going to come out in a very raw shape to prove that you're there. And I think part of what I hear in Danny saying is, is we, live in a cult uh, we live in a society of mimicry. We live in a society of mimicry, and we will be saluted and honored 
providing we keep the fucking lie alive. Yeah. I remember there was a, I was just through the throwaway line one time, and it was like, a, um, said, you know, mother, I'm going out to my room, I'm going to listen to Dylan for 20 years. Yeah. And I pretty much did that. And given 1967 or 66, it was probably the right choice. You know, yeah. there was about this and that, but there was something in me that knew that all this other stuff wasn't. And that this was the beginning of something else. And then, you know. Well, I mean, what I love is the fact that our, our boy listens. And out of that, there's a certain level of uh, authority that comes from being in, in, tr in relationship mm. with with a certain level of nature, you know, that, that calms him. So he, when, the, when, he, when he gets to the point of being able to have to make, he can command his fellow travelers and he can talk to the witch, mm -hmm. you know, say, no, I'm not going to do this, I'm going to do it. And he can actually confront the witch by having stilled himself long enough, you know, to develop, you know, a true sense of who he is, which I think is authenticity gives you a certain, uh, without having to exercise authority, you're, you already have it, you know. I, I got to keep coming back to that central image at the beginning that we are going to meet the woman on the canoe. You know, you, that process is probably going to happen or has happened. But whether or not we have the, the perceptive intelligence to see what is standing behind her canoe and what is standing behind ours. And so when they are speaking to us, we know what is being spoken through them. You know, and when that falls apart, you know, we all get married young, and the rest is history. Sorry. It was significant in the beginning. He didn't choose the uncle. No. The uncle, did not, and it's not his father. No. It's, as Robert, I've heard him say, it's, it's, it's the older, unrelated, you know, mm. males that, and it's sort of validating in, in some way, that the uncle knows things that the boy doesn't, and he has to go out to the woods for five years. Mm. Well, doesn't the uncle have more influence than the father? Well, when he listen with the father, I think not. I think he needs to not listen to the father, but he can listen to the uncle. At the risk of repetition, uh, and I'm sure you guys have all heard this before, I, I remember Hillman saying something. He said, you know, the job of the father, the role of the father, is, is not to be looking at your deep soul and saying, I understand it and see you clearly. He's more concerned with a roof over your head and food in your belly. But it's the unrelated or it's the uncle that clearly sees who you are and how you feel. And the mis I think one of the great confusion in contemporary mentoring is that we are so desperate for fathering. And we are also so desperate for mentoring, it gets terribly muddy. And suddenly you are living in the spare room of the mentor and it has turned and become very strange. But the old idea is the mentor sees you very clearly and sends you on your way. Yeah. I followed my uncle for many, many years. I remember when he died, my dad was standing in the living room and I had to tell him that he died. Mm -hmm. And my father looked at me and said, well, you always loved him more than you loved me. Uh -oh. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, but that was the beginning of me working with my father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just it was very painful. And uh, what did he say to you? Uh, you loved your uncle more than you loved him, uh -huh. mm -hmm. and I did. I yeah. mean, that's I rejected my father. What happened after that? Uh, <laughs> My father became ill, and I started taking care of him. Um, and it was suggested to me to tell him that I love him. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I did, I got no response. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And I started screaming at him in the, heart in the hospital, why can't you tell me that you love me? And he turned to me and he said, Would you do why do you think I work so hard all my life? Well, yeah. 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 Well, well, that was it. I, do you, any of you, this is a personal question, but it's coming directly. For me, the, the, business of, the business of making money for my family is an act of love. But it's, it seems almost invisible sometimes. 
And it's very hard, you know, when you're, you're out there busting your gut to, 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 that act, to keep that act of love up because you love your kids and you love your partner, but it isn't necessarily visible. Uh, and in, the, in a society now where our, our loved ones are not necessarily working with us, you know, the old idea, and it's in I and John, is that in the younger ones and in our family, we will go to some space to work which they do not know. They maybe never even visited it. And so that place itself fills with the imagination and fills with the presence of the witch. And suddenly we're living in a house full of these glass mountains or these ice mountains. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, Robert's poem, uh, Looking to the Father, and all of the things the Father does to express his love. And still, we don't feel loved in the way that we want to be loved. We are loved in the way that we don't <laughs> recognize. Mm -hmm. We've got a couple of hours till the workshop, and just one thought before we leave. Uh, we were just doing what you all know and we know as feeding the story, uh, you know, telling the story, feeding the story. Why not try walking the story? Yeah. Walking the story. Yeah. After your lunch, you may want to just walk, walk the images. There's plenty of space around here, pl plenty of quietness, and a lovely thing to do in it, it reflects on the question Jay at the back had earlier on. And it's simply narrow your vision. And for 20 minutes, more or less, <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't get me started. 19, yeah. 19 and a half. Yeah. <laughs> 20 minutes, more or less, look at a one square foot of earth or, or the side of a tree, but narrow your, your, your vision to that and see what you see. See what lives within that tiny universe. Uh, and see what happens. Walk the story and see what the natural world is desperate for your attention. It wants us to get woefully involved in the kind of relationship we had 100,000 years ago. So let's start doing it today, now. Let's walk the story. <laughs>